Hello and welcome to the Brooklyn Rail 776 New Social Environment. I'm Carolyn, a Programs Associate here at the Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation featuring Miguel Abreu, Isaac Burbick, Faust Cabra, Wallace Whitney, and Andrew Wilbright. We are thrilled to welcome poet Jen Fisher here to close today's program. Before we get started, the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges Black Lives Matter. And here in New York, we are on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenni Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We recognize land acknowledgments are not a replacement for necessary decolonial work, but serve as a reminder of place of the legacies of dispossession and enslavement that sustain and enrich the stolen land we're speaking from. And now to introduce today's guests and host. Miguel Abreu was born in New York City and grew up in Paris. He established, established his namesake gallery in 2006 to nurture and promote what Abreu describes as conceptually challenging and plastically realized works of art. In 2010, he co-founded Sequence Press, a publishing enterprise focusing on contemporary philosophy and the arts. Isak Burbick is a New York-based artist and co-founder of Brief Histories, Working in photography, video, and performance, his recent projects tell stories about fossils and fuels, cactus and earthworks, meteorites, shrapnel, and steel factories. Faust Cabra is a curator and writer living in New York. She is curator and director of Brief Histories, an art gallery and publishing project she co-founded in 2011. Cabra has organized exhibitions at notable institutions around the world. She was assistant curator at the Guggenheim Foundation and co-director of Glo Global Art Forum 13 Dubai. Her writing and interviews appear in several publications and she is the editor of Tame the Wilderness, as well as No to the Invasion, Breakdowns and Side Effects. Wallace Whitney is a painter based in the Bronx. His work has been the subject of many solo exhibitions. Whitney is an educator who has taught at the University of Tennessee in the Tyler School of Art in Philadelphia. His practice includes writing about, about art, um, including catalog essays for numerous artists and for the online magazine, Art Critical. Whitney is a co-founder of the Artist Run Gallery Canada. And our host today, artist, curator, and critic, Andrew Woolbright is based in Brooklyn and is an MFA graduate from RISD in painting. Woolbright is a co-founder and director of the gallery Below Grand, located on the Lower East Side in New York. In addition to curating, he is an editor at large here at the Brooklyn Rail, and he currently teaches at School of Visual Arts and Pratt Institute. Thank you all so much for being here today, and I'll pass it over to you, Andrew. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for uh, stopping by today and listening into our conversation. I'm really excited about this, uh, this panel. Um, and I also just want to thank the Brooklyn Rail for uh, all the behind the scenes work to make conversations like this appear so seamlessly happen every day. Um, and I also want to thank the rail for um, letting me do this issue, uh, because it's something that, um, in addition to being a part of the rail community and really feeling like I found a family and a home with all of you um, in writing, um, this issue really allowed me to uh, explain myself, which I, I think has kind of been a, uh, something within me for a long time as someone that um, is interested in the art world and coming at it from multiple uh, directions. Um, you know, something that I have felt and something that um, I, a number of people in this issue have felt is the strangeness of people not knowing how to talk to us. Um, I've had studio visits with gallerists that have, you know, asked me if they do a show with me, um, you know, will I still run a gallery? Will I still write? Will I still teach? Um, thinking that I'm doing these things out of some absence or out of, uh, you know, like a part of this like trajectory. Um, and uh, the answer is no. I've also had students that uh, you know, I've said you should start a project space or you should start finding and creating space for yourself and others. And they're responded with, well, I don't want to be considered a gallerist or a curator. I want to be considered an artist. Um, so for me, this issue is really a great spot uh, for uh, hoping, or I hope, put together a space of people that can uh, 
really argue this poetics of space or this poetics of a way of being that is really about giving space to other people in addition to your own practice. Uh, it's something that means a lot to me and I think it's becoming more and more important to do um, with how streamlined and professionalized the art world is getting. Um, so uh, something that I wanted to bring up because they're not here, uh, getting to put together this issue, um, a uh, number of the people, the contributors are artists. A number of the contributors are artists that run galleries and spaces. And a number of people are just dealing with complexity in their own way. Um, and I thought that uh, I was really excited that uh, Molly Zuckerman Hartung, who could not be here today, um, and Alex Galloway, who could not be here today, I thought their contributions to this issue really did a great job of framing um, framing the issue and like what we're all up against. Molly wrote a really brilliant piece, I hope you all get to read, about difficulty from a psychoanalytic point of view, like what happens when we're confronted with a difficult text to us. Um, do we externalize the object of that frustration towards someone else? Um, she has a great moment where she speaks about how this is a reflection of the democratic mind versus the fascist mind that when we address and confront complexity, we have the choice to like allow that to affect our identity or to externalize and push that out away from us to keep ourselves you know, intact. Um, and then Alex Galloway, a wonderful thinker, uh, professor at NYU, uh, wrote one of my favorite books, Protocol. We got to speak about, uh, I got to interview him about um, walled gardens and the sobriety that social media and internet space creates. Um, and also this idea of smooth space, it's a Deleuzian idea, the smooth space versus the striated space. And so I wanted to um, uh, start the contributions out with the, the issues and the difficulties kind of presented to the art world, um, because I feel like oftentimes when I'm talking to curators and gallerists, there's a sense that there's this over-determination or this flattening or simplifying of art artistic practices for what galleries are intended to be and represent and do. Um, and then uh, the people that I got to work with and invite to be contributors to this piece, in my mind, are all uh, wonderful points of light. Uh, who are finding ways to create complexity and strangeness and brilliance with what they're doing. Um, so before we get into all of your works and introduce you, I'm wondering how uh, each of you uh, feel in response to some of the difficulties that you're being presented with running a gallery space. Uh, Wallace, Miguel, Faus, Isaac, all of you are running a gallery in addition to your own practices or in addition to everything else. I'm wondering how you feel things have shifted or what you feel like your work is currently trying to address or what your program is up against. And Wallace, I wanted to start with you. Are you okay with that? Uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks for inviting me to be here today uh, to talk to you. Um, yeah, I, I think... Uh, I like that idea of complexity and I like the idea of embracing complexity. Um, and what, what is it like running a gallery now versus when we started 20 years ago? I mean, it seems there is this sort of hamster wheel that the uh, art market has, has put us on. And I think that that can um, stifle uh, community and conversation sometimes because we're, um, you know, sometimes, you know, we're, we're on this kind of art fair track. So we're constantly dragging art out of people's studios. And, um, you know, it, it, as you get, you know, as we've gotten this sort of middle age position, like, uh, you, it's, it's sort of like you have, have to constantly, um, get bigger to compete with the larger galleries. So you're not, like eaten by them, eaten alive. And so there is this sort of uh, bargain that you make with the market that it's like, well, we want to exist as uh, an alternative, but we also have to partake in what the, what the market's demanding of us. So I think that that's the, um, 
uh, challenge and the complexity for us at the moment. And um, as we hit middle age, and it's also trying to be very, very specific about what we represent, what we mean, and try to hold on to that as much as we can inside of this system that we didn't really create, but we're sort of a part of. Um, so I think there's been a lot of soul searching at the gallery from the last year or so about like, what, what do we want to be and what, what kind of um, art do we want to show and uh, what do we want to mean to our audience? So I think those are th things that we've uh, been facing recently and thinking a lot about. Makes total sense. Um, I mean, I, th I think that's like a, something we talk a lot about at Below Grant, which is like our rent is very low at the moment. So we can, we have the privilege of taking lots of risks, but uh, for us to scale up to accommodate the artists that we work with, yes. we also have to start thinking about uh, who we show and if they can sell work or if we're going to all go bankrupt together yeah which is <laughs> <laughs> very difficult yeah it's miguel, true. Oh, miguel what are some of the issues that you feel like uh are, are things that you're thinking about running the space <clears throat> well you know i always like to reduce it to to what does it mean to um manifest the potential adventure that an artwork has built into it right that's that's um i feel that unless we feel that we're actually servicing this idea um we we are losing the battle the battle for art to be an exciting environment right and as the market develops and as while i was talking about while this was talking about this kind of repetitive um art fair driven environment i think that we and the public feels that there's potentially less adventure in, in what they see just because of the sheer mass of, of uh, propositions and the saturation point. Um, you know, so I always, I always think about what does it mean? You know, how do we make a show that's just not another show, you know, among 500 or 600 or 700 in the urban space that we live in? Um, and of course, it's very it's a very difficult problem to to uh, to face, but you know that's how we have to. Uh, I feel I have to approach the work that I do, which is how do I make it exciting for uh, for people, for the artists first, for the work itself. How do you unpack the work so that it actually has a chance to produce its effects? How can the gallery serve as that first and foremost, right? Um, so what I'm describing is the fact that we have so many filters now that um, that make that adventure difficult to experience, uh, including the schedule, including the, the 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 number of propositions. So yeah, I you know that's what I try to do. So when I come to work every day, I say, what am I doing that is not just selling art? You know, uh, what else is there that we can? bring to the ticket that that's of course services the work but also uh as a kind of spiritual dimension to the to the to the proposition um yeah so i'm not necessarily optimistic i just feel that yes the galleries have to reinvent themselves in order to remain exciting places to visit you know and um there are many ways to to think about it it's it's not that easy to come up with solutions, but we're still trying. Isaac and Faust, I feel like um, you you uh, run a space that we'll get to uh, in slides, but uh, have been very responsive to some of these issues and have been flexible in how you represent yourself as a gallery and how a gallery looks. But I'm wondering what some of the things that you've sensed are or reaction points for you with the gallery or things you're cognizant of as you put together your programming. Is that is that addressed to me? No. Oh no, I'm sorry. That was to to brief histories. Yeah. Each oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I might cut out. Yeah. Yeah. I'll I'll start by um saying a couple of things and um on the on the idea of difficulty and 
we agree that there are always relevant methods of engagement, which both create possibilities to work with artists who do interesting, complex, and layered work, um, and to engage what, what you mentioned earlier, your um, introduction from Alex's piece, to engage um, both the smooth spaces and the striated ones, the structured ones, with a kind of bumpy, with a bumpy skin that um, interrogates both and, and in fact, maybe Brief Histories is often interested in occupying this uncomfortable location within the, the binary. Um, and we find that, that it can be both practical in engaging established systems as well as radical and tactical with the intention for the outcomes to produce some changes within those establishments. Um, and we think about refusal um, as well, I want to mention an article from 2014 by Tirdad Zolkader, where he describes shades of no, and he describes how we can often find cultural workers withdrawing from participation due to disagreeable conditions or unethical relations. And he also describes Lee Lozano's dropout piece as one of the most uncompromising, iconic boycotts of all time, a hard no, um, or a softer no by saying yes. And though you do not self-deport, this is a, a quote exactly, though you do not self-deport exactly, your compliance makes integration more difficult. Um, and, and I think that that's where a lot of the work um, has been for us. Um, it gets communication departments working on how to um, uh, present or handle your case and your choice of words. Mm -hmm. And, and, and it just, it's also kind of, uh, for me, I understood this term of like difficulty is also a difficulty of um, a, a, a legibility. And in, in, in this case, I feel like maybe we share this um, with what you were also introducing and, and speaking about from your own personal experience, but a kind of like um, illegibility or um, an understanding, whether of like people or the art or, um, and, and then it kind of, um, you know, makes me also uh, think that it's also a choice of, you know, um, you know, like clamoring for the right to opacity or or inhabiting those areas where it is kind of this um, other space. And when we were thinking about this other space, um, uh, I couldn't help but uh, remember this uh, interview that we had also published in our first publication, um, Tame the Wilderness, um, where this idea of being in the negative that the artists uh, Basil Abbas and Rowan Abu Rahme discussed with um, Amal Isa, who is currently the, the programs director at Eflux. And um, so I just, if I, I could just like read a little excerpt from that, um, you know, Rowan, the artist, she she talks about this kind of difficulty um, and, and this also shape-shifting, um, which, which I think for us, like we we choose the freedom to shape shift and to adapt to our harsh environment. And so her excerpt it goes as it goes like this. So it's it's a question of how to continue to mutate in order to survive in conditions where you should have already died, whether physically or through forms of slow violence. Um, and then she mentions that's why Edward Said's text is so interesting for us because he talks about it. He doesn't say mutation. He says something like how easily we change and are changed. For Basil and I, the question was, how can you think of these conditions, not just as negative outcomes, but as the very tools from which you create and become unbound from colonial capture conditions and time. So you embrace the idea of being inside something that's broken and move away from the idea of a politics of wanting to fix that thing or of wanting for it to be recognized as something that is happening to you. It's a question of how to be in the thing that's lacking, how to be in the negative and in the loss and create different possibilities of being and breathing. And that really resonated for us and we kind of, also ride along this thought of hers um, and these artists in terms of how to also kind of survive and make a place, taking up the space, but also giving up 
uh, giving space. I, I, that, I love that quote. Thanks for sharing it with us. Because um, I, I, I like existing within the place of lacking or in the place of what is broken. Like, I just think that like for me personally, uh, I always knew I wanted to be an artist from a young age, but my issue was always, I hated the idea of the studio. Uh, or I always envied my friends who were musicians and would load up the van and like go to Milwaukee or like Cleveland. And uh, there was like a, a bond there. And for me, it was, um, the issue of art was always the isolation to deal with. Um, I liked the actual practice of making it. And, but all of it also, being an artist is the frustration of, of constantly butting up against situations that are broken or lacking, or, or like you said, arguing for opacity. And I think it's, it's exciting that all of you have figured out ways to do that as a together do that as uh, something that can be built up together from the inside of it. Um, I'd really like to switch things over if we can to the slideshow so we can give our audience an idea of what we're talking about um, with all of you. But, you know, Miguel, um, I knew as soon as I was invited to uh, put together this issue that I wanted to talk to you about the show that you put together right after COVID uh, Poet Engineers. In my mind, it's uh, maybe my favorite show of the last 10 years. It's certainly up there. I think it's the perfect show. And um, from an outside perspective, uh, before I uh, got had the chance to know you, I really appreciated the complexity you were able to address new technology and new media and how it still had this uh, this classical approach or this way of like looking back. Um, so I'm really excited we got to have a talk about it, but I'm wondering if you could talk to us about how uh, Poet Engineers came together. <clears throat> well, first of all, I had time to think and it was really a, for me an exercise to sort of try to rationalize and maybe clarify um, what I've been doing all along. Um, and turn it into an exhibition. But, um, the, um, you know, the, it, it was also an attempt to try to situate the show or at least locate the show at an existential level. You know, most group shows have to do with a theme that's an external theme that the curators um, then illustrate with works that they choose. I wanted to try to see what it, what it means in the most positive way to be an artist today, what potential do we have? And not me, but artists in general, could I come up with a, um, you know, a, a kind of existential description that gives uh, the possibilities of the time? So I came up with the title, The Poet Engineers, and then I thought about, okay, what are the tools that artists have today that they didn't have before that distinguishes uh, the present time from other periods? And then I just, you know, simply listed what I considered to be those tools, which would, which would allow the poet engineer to, well, the poet engineer came after, but would allow the artist to invent new forms in the best possible positive way. So I, I came up with a very simple observation that we have new materials today, we have new software tools, and we have new fabrication techniques. So maybe being a poet engineer is the conditions under which you might be in a good position to invent new forms. So that's basically the idea. It's very simple. Um, and then I looked at works that I thought was were as imaginative as, 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 as possible within that mode of experience. Um, yeah, so this is a PRE uh, complex piece that he made, uh, you know, based on uh, asking someone with, an MRI or a, you know, on his head, her head, uh, asking to think about something like a tool or like an animal. And as the person imagines that things, the, the data is being processed and given over to a deep learning software, which tries to reproduce the mental image. And so this is what came up. It was uh, obviously a monstrous formation. Uh, a chimeric formation that is supposed to look like something that exists, but 
you know, the software and, and the, the 3D um, software that tries to re represent the, uh, the, the mental image doesn't quite succeed and produces yeah, this I, imaginative solution. Yeah, sorry. No, 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 no. I, I was just saying, I, I really appreciate that this was, I remember this was one of the first shows we were kind of able to see or still felt like we we're coming out of the lockdown or coming out of the fog of it. And um, it, I was impressed by you taking the effort to set up a criteria or think of a criteria and imagine a way of seeing art um, that you that create an object, an object of agreeance or disagreeance from an audience. Um, and also the show itself has this wonderful um, uh, am uh, ambivalence to technology. I felt that so many shows lacked. It wasn't a fetish or utopic vision of technology. It wasn't skeptical. It was just using it as a part of an assemblage or part of like uh, the, the vision of the artist. And I know Jean-Luc Moulin is, uh, was a big part in um, inspiring the show uh, for you. Could you talk about his practice and what, what got you to thinking about this poet engineer through his practice? Yeah, well, I mean, Moulin is one of the most exciting artists to talk to and to work with for me because, you know, his work is always about asking a question or setting up a problem or making an observation, um, setting up a riddle and then finding a plastic solution to the problem. Um, so it's a very objective uh, solution-based um, environment. Um, and, you know, he is a tremendous plastician and has an inc incredible artistic imagination. This work you see here is basically him, uh, it's an age-old problem, you know, to make a geometric shape with, um, with uh, or to contaminate a, a, an absolute geometric shape with uh, human presence. And what he does here is basically use the bones of the, uh, of the arm and the leg and put them together in their real, their real dimensions, their real measurements, and try to produce a pyramid with them. And then the whole thing is made out of bronze. So it's an imperfect pyramid. It goes back to Leonardo da Vinci. That's how the show started. Uh, it's a classical and it's, a, you know, bronze is the oldest material you can think of. Um, so there's like a whimsical piece, um, the confrontation of geometry and human bones, try to activate a shape. Um, so yeah, he's, he's constantly inventing forms. That's, that's what his job is. And, and it's all very clear and very objective. And I was, um, I find it very, uh, I think it's also the kind of um, way of thinking and making art, which is maybe not um, the most uh, distributed today. So yeah, it's idea of clarity and objects uh, as solutions to problems with very much what the poet engineer is involved with. No, something that just occurred to me as you're talking about uh, Moulin's work is, um, knowing your background as a filmmaker, you know, like there's, I don't know if it's true, you know more than I do, but um, filmmakers, auteur filmmakers oftentimes have an actor that they oftentimes work with over and over again, or have like a, like a type of avatar that they've been tro ventriloquized through someone they see something themselves in. And I feel like Mulan in some ways, by setting up a condition of a uh, a question that has to be solved. I feel like maybe maybe he represents that for you as a, as a, a close actor. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's the, he's the artist as hobbyist also, as playful, whimsical practitioner. But he's also the artist that cuts through, you know, the kind of open-ended situation in which we are. Um, I we spoke about this before, uh, um, uh, Andrew, is that, you know, he considers the, the responsibility of, of the artist is to, to find the contour of the object, to find the edge of the object uh, in order to complete it. Uh, and once the artist does that, has, you know, then the work is done and there's no reason to repeat it. So it's an, an injunction to imagine something new every day, right? Which I think is a healthy uh, uh, position to be in.
uh, as an artist. Uh, and it's a way of pushing yourself and that he does that naturally, but uh, none of his work look the same, but they're always very clear and very resolved. And, you know, so that was a very helpful to have an artist to talk to like this, who um, exemplifies the, 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 the poet engineer as, a, as an existential condition very nicely. Mm -hmm. Can we move on to the, the next slide here? Uh, yeah, and um, I, I love this. We talk about it in the interview, but I loved the inclusion of this Jonathan Lasker piece that uh, before your show or this group show, I hadn't really thought of his work in terms of the integer, but in close proximity with some of the other works, uh, it, it, it made the, the marks and the textures feel more like a pastiche or more like a copy paste or some, some reference to a larger system. Um, that, that way of it being itself, but also good curation can bring in a, a larger context. Uh, but how are you thinking of Lasker's uh, inclusion? Well, I mean, he's, a, he's very clearly somebody who objectifies the basic elements of painting to the hilt. And as such, you know, um, presents them materially as such, and then recombines them into a new visuality. So he's a he's a painting engineer. You know, I'm not even the first person who called him that. I realized later that he was already described as such by in an essay which I read later. I forget who wrote it. But you know, in today's world where we have a lot of you know neo figuration, um, I thought it would be a nice inclusion to 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 present this very sharp practitioner of painting. Um, really uh, pushes the elements to their, to the point where they become, you know, almost hystericized, almost their opposite. You know, they're just at the limit of their material um, existence. So he stretches out, separates, isolates the elements to the point of, uh, to such a, yeah, to an extreme level and then just recombines them. Re so I think it's still a very fresh practice that, uh, is is good to look at in today's environment in particular. Yeah, I also think of like the word phrasing, like this, like phrasing of like a, a language of painting and like putting these each phrase next to each other. Like what Ranciere discusses is the the sentences image or the uh, the montage, like it's a montage of different textures, maybe rather than like seeing some type of just all. It's wonderful. Yeah. Um, and then can we, uh, next slide, uh, Chloe? Yes, what a cool okay. piece. Well, that's the work by Flynn Jameson, young artist from the Pacific Northwest. This work was just, it's, uh, it's actually a kinetic piece that makes a sound. There's this kind of, you can see this, um, this out of focus uh, shelf in the middle. And what it goes up and down, you know, incessantly. And what it does basically is, is position, um, uh, works of art at the ideal viewing height. And the group of works of art that it's actually adapting to is this kind of abandoned um, group of works by students at the University of Washington. And all these works are like basically abandoned throughout the school. So he just recuperated, made a list, and then basically presents them with uh, in absentia with the, uh, with the moving shelf. Is Andrew gone? <laughs> I think we might have just lost Andrew briefly. Oh, oh. there he is. Oh, so sorry, everyone. <laughs> uh, I realized that my Wi-Fi was not working or not coming across like at all as I was talking. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I mean, the kinetic motion in this piece for everything else was, uh, again, like thinking of moving things next to stationary paintings. I just thought it was, it was a wonderful uh balancing act that you were able to pull off i think we have one more slide is that correct i think that's it okay um uh wallace um you uh you know have been obviously a painter the entire time you've also founded canada and i'm wondering about how you feel about the the relationship between the two um I, I think that there are things that you very eloquently put together in your essay for your contribution of mm. um, the idea of uh, structure versus um, uh, like the this like ability to 
free gesture or like be impulsive. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm wondering about how how you felt as a painter in establishing Canada. What was the lack or the absence that you addressed uh, or wanted to start curating other people um, that you were feeling within the own studio? Yeah, I mean, I think um, what you said about wanting to be an artist and experiencing friends who are in bands uh, really hit home for me. Um, the idea of solitude as a studio practitioner um, fully didn't fully encompass what I wanted to um, be in the arts, um, and, you know, as a cultural maker and producer. <clears throat> and um, when the gallery started in 2000, the climate, I think, was incredibly different than it is today. Uh, I think that the structures were way more rigid and uh, much more hierarchical and smaller and more contained. And it just seemed like an absolute possibility to even imagine having a show. And then I didn't particularly like how I felt when I went into galleries. I didn't like the feeling of um, being a, you know, suspect or something, you know, there's something suspicious about even the act of viewing, if you weren't, you know, willing to uh, buy or something like that. So the Gallery Canada, I think was, you know, kind of a response to that um, world. And um, so it felt like just a, a normal outcropping of, of conversation of wanting to have a space and I think my work felt out of step with what was being produced and shown at that time. And there was no context for it. So, and here I was in New York and there were friends that, you know, felt similarly, um, Sarah Brayman, Phil Grauer, Aaron Brewer, you know, these, these artists were um, sharing the same sort of frustrations. And, it, and then at the end of the day, it's just fairly easy to start a gallery. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's hard to do it for 20 years, but the act of beginning something is actually quite easy. So it just seemed like very uh, obvious that you kind of have to take the means into your own, own hands. Um, so, yeah, and I think I think there's something about age in there as well. Like, uh, I think this sort of amateurism is sort of acceptable at, you know, 20 or 30 or whatever. And then as you get older, suddenly it's like you have to, you know, it's something, something's wrong with you if you're not specializing or like, what, what, what are you doing? And I, I, I appreciated your comment too. Like, no, this is a choice. This is a decision. This is how I want to be in the world. Um, and that idea that I kind of tried to get at in the essay about um, starting some, starting a process that you don't really know where it's going to go, but sort of hopefully there's some sort of um, payoff you know, in, in the process, you know, something exciting or um, unexpected happens. And so I sort of think that the, the, pra the painting practice and then the, and then the, the gallery practice are, are related in that sense, that there is a certain like heuristics involved in sort of starting something without having a kind of clear conception of where it's going. Um, and yeah, so that's, that's that. And then, you know, finding your way finding your own personality within the world of um, running a gallery. So I sort of touched on that in the essay a little bit, like using the metaphor of like a plow horse, you know, somebody who's kind of doing the same thing repetitively over and over again, but also having sort of like uh, a front row seat at something that's unfolding in front of you. And also having some sort of like very slow motion ability to respond, you know, like some people are much mm -hmm. more uh, willing to absorb things over time, you know, and I think the, the, the kind of the metaphor of the plow horse was that willingness to kind of like endure, you know, over over years to kind of see an arc of a narrative or something like that. And I think that the art world is so fast paced that that that's really not encouraged or not allowed or something like that. So I don't know. That's you know that's sort of a, a generic answer, I guess, to what you're asking me, but. Not, not generic at all. No, I mean, I've, I've always looked up to you and the Canada team uh, because I, I've always appreciated your longevity because I, I know, like you said, it's really easy to begin something. A lot of artists begin 
but you know galleries like yours and Gordon Robichaux and 47 Canal and DeRosha galleries that the artist run gallery year after year after year is saying like how do we figure out how to be a gallery and keep going mm -hmm. like, I think the presence of a gallery that that stays and evolves is so helpful for a community and a scene to like yeah. uh um, I, I think it's wonderful. Could you could you talk about your how it? Because um, I, I thought you did it so eloquently how how it how you feel it in the studio um, and mm -hmm. may going back to this like structure of an idea versus the ability to be influenced and the ability to have improvisation within a painting like this one. Yeah, yeah. This is this is definitely an improvisation. Um, uh, I think, yeah, I mean, it, it's like um, thinking about, you know, developing friendships, developing rivalries, developing healthy com competitive spirits with people who are somewhat aligned or disaligned or whatever to sort of, you know, there's that sort of back and forth and thinking about practices that aren't mine while, while working, I think is like, very you know healthy to kind of rebut or use that space as a, as a way to cleanse and sort of understand your response to something you know so looking at shows is very important to me you know i, I still make a habit of going to see exhibitions and um, you know i i, I can't exactly honestly can't totally remember what i said <laughs> in the essay but i think there's like there's some of that, you know, there's, and, and I, I know that, I know that like people rely on me as well, you know, that there's a sort of like uh, um, exchange there, you know, and I, I know I also sort of think about it in terms of like psychoanalysts who, you know, you can't actually do that unless you've been analyzed yourself, sort of like you, you, you have to have, how can I talk to an artist without actually having a practice, you know, that, so I can, and it's not a power thing, it's more of an empathy thing. It's sort of about mm -hmm. like being able to sort of um, imagine myself in someone else's position and be able to actually respond correctly or something like that. I mean, I, I think galleries are amazing. There's so many amazing galleries, but I can't imagine doing that without having the, the release of actually doing it myself. Because then I think it becomes more um, theoretical or sort of, in the mind, I think it needs. I think I need to have it in the body as well, and then in mm. uh, to manifest it physically. You know, and I think that that's a constant humbling experience to kind of go to the studio and and do the paintings. So yeah, yeah, and the moves kind of from the inside or yeah, the closer, like you said, yeah. like you yeah. forget how hard <laughs> art is to make. You know, it's <laughs> yeah. it look deceptively simple, but. Um, yeah. yeah yeah so anyway i'm glad i'm glad i get to show a few paintings like these were um yeah. paintings from a show i did called take the air which was i think my last mm -hmm. solo show in in new york at this gallery saison benetier and uh um it was sort of this idea of like the city becoming kind of a sanitarium i was sort of thinking about thomas mann's uh magic mountain where people would go to this you know sanitarium and then you know this sort of pre-scientific age, you know, suddenly we were in this pre-scientific age again, where there was no answers for ail what what ailed us, and and the world became much more sort of uh, um, mysterious and confusing and uh, scary. Obviously, my wife was uh, uh, a doctor in a public hospital in the Bronx, and she was working on the COVID wards at the time. I was making these paintings, so there was this sort of sensation of uh, things falling apart, structures coming apart, um, the world kind of falling apart, and then also sort of this sort of humanity that was sort of leaking in around that space, like, you know, the seven o'clock salute where people would bang pots and pans and that sort of like sound making, this communal sort of experience of, uh, you know, a plague essentially. And then, you know, not, not going to the country, but staying in this urban, situation and um, being a part of this community. So this, these paintings aren't directly related to that, but I think the romance of that a little bit, like thinking about the Decameron or, you know, art that was made during plagues. And uh, so, the, so the Take the Air was about sort of uh, sanitation and um, 
romance, mm -hmm. I think, and sort of structure, you know, all those, all those things. Mm -hmm. um, so these, these paintings have this, there's the romance is a character in the paintings, but there's also this sort of idea of like structure and uh, anyway. Well, I, I, I like I like the sense of structure. I like the sense that I can tell moments in the paintings where it seems like something kind of activates the rest of the painting or like a mark generates a repetition of the mark and a change of the mark, but also <laughs> your ability to reveal the understructures. Like it it feels like an honest way of building up the surface. If there's yes. such a thing. Well, that's nice. Yeah, I think. I make an effort, you know, that the paintings can sometimes take a long time, but the the, um, the first mark that I make is as uh, accessible as the last mark. You know, there's mm -hmm. got to be this sort of like uh, no tricks up my sleeve kind of energy in, mm -hmm. in the work that I, I feel is like, um, you know, that crosses over to the idea of the gallery as being a place mm -hmm. where conversation or you know human exchange can happen versus commerce just strictly con i mean commerce obviously happens as well but this sort of idea of um sort of exposing um the mechanisms of the making and that actually is the art in a certain way um and being kind yeah, of I, with that yeah i like that there's uh this, this is a type of kind of abstraction that's about covering up that you're never fully covering up maybe it's a, a good way to say it like it's it's nice to see the understructure and the overstructure yeah. and, uh, i mean it's, it's permeable literally you know so it's mm -hmm. something that's, yeah. that's, that's a good way of saying that yeah yeah gorgeous painting this one feels a little bit different or I like the soft, the soft airiness in the back versus like kind of the harder gesture in the front. How, what was the system that you were thinking of as you approached this one? Well, I mean, I, my studio looks out over the flight path of LaGuardia airport. Um, so mm -hmm. I was always, I'm always trying to figure out how to do something with the contrails, like the, ex, the exhaust of the jets in the sky. And it feels like mm -hmm. a very, kind of romantic, you know, kind of modern romantic thing. And you're, and you know, you, you know, around five o'clock, right as the sun is beginning to set, the airport gets busy for whatever reason. So it's just like a chain of reaction of these things. And uh, so I wanted to kind of capture that. So these are really um, light, um, you know, sp you know, spray, spray tools that I developed on my own that I made using auto supplies. And then they're oil paint, sprayed oil paint outside. And then I don't know, if, you know, the form in the middle is is a much more um, rooted, grounded, sort of almost man-made kind of structure that's sort of thicker mm -hmm. and kind of a response to airiness, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. So that, that's what this this painting seems is, is about for me a little bit. Yeah, I like how the figure implies the the ground and the ground implies the figure. That, not this figure, but figure all the subject. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, like you said, and there's definitely something that's more airy and atmospheric mm -hmm. and then there's something that's more um almost mechanical mm -hmm. as well yeah and uh do we have one more slide from wallace i think there may be one more yeah yeah mm -hmm. uh this one is a you know for the show i developed these um different tools and this is a uh stamp that i made out of a large piece of rubber and i was using this repetitious x to kind of create a uh, structure and um, uh, yeah, thinking about sort of a, a cross between sort of um, kind of atmospheric painting and sort of structural painting and sort of trying to kind of combine the two <laughs> for whatever reason. Yeah. I think I'm, I'm in love with both and, uh, you know, trying to think about how they could maybe coexist or cancel each other out or something like that inside mm -hmm. of, of the same painting. And I kind of like the mark um, as well, so. Yeah, well, it's, it, it, yeah, like I really appreciate Molly's piece of talking about the honesty of talking about being attracted to difficulty and complication, saying like there's something about me that sets up. I was all, she's like, I was always chasing texts by Glissant and Derrida and wanted to know them. Like there's something about me that has to resolve the difficult. And I think that um, it's interesting that as an abstract painter, you're, you're, it seems in, in these that you're resolving tensions between kind of like uh, stamp versus airiness and things. And you're doing so in really, you're finding the, the cohesion in between. Nice. 
Yeah, yeah, I think so. That, that sort of sense of illusions and uh, structure and or process, you know, I think they don't necessarily have to not exist together, I don't think. Yeah, yeah. Wonderful. Thank you, Wallace. Thank you. Um, and then uh, is the next, yes. Um, and then Isak Faust, uh, I, you know, I came across your uh, program through the work of Coleman Collins, uh, who I think is just one of the most exciting artists working today and um, have gotten to know you and your program since then. I was wondering, as I'm really excited about the intimacy that you share with your artists or the close uh, family that you create with the people that you work with, but also the way that your space has really been this gesture that kind of forms into like a traditional gallery and then has, you know, turned into a zine, turned into a book, turned into an ice cream stand. Uh, can you tell us about this like shape-shifting gesture you've come up with? Um, yeah. Maybe, okay. I, maybe I'll just say something about, to, to start us off about this uh, particular slide, this poster, which is from the first um, Brief Histories show in, in 2011. And our primary interest for, for this particular show, and, and maybe they, the interests and the sort of like the, like the point of what we're doing changes as well from show to show, from project to project. But the primary interest here was to work with the idea that um, there was a, a tremor in in uh, a kind of a moment of reckoning in in the world in, in this in this particular period, um, it was uh, eventually called the Arab Spring, um, and we were interested in how to sort of work work quickly, um, and uh, uh, so this engaging the idea of uh, telepresence, engaging the idea of uh, kind of destabilizing the the prime the, the primacy of objects so we were working a lot with new media work that could be emailed or that could be uh, um, mailed in a particular way do dodging problems of shipping so a lot of the initial uh, ideas were here are all the obstacles that you face to make an exhibition and how do we subvert each and every one of these obstacles and a part of what the first show also did was we tried to involve all of our friends. This is a very counter, uh, is a very not not a very good advice, I think, for <laughs> for anyone. But uh, we thought that this was exactly the kind of thing we wanted to do. Um, so the editing and the way that the show came together was uh, uneven, unruly, contradictory. Um, because the editing was actually just about our own um, relationships with artists and people in the world. Um, this proved to be a very interesting strategy and we repeated it, um, but, uh, but eventually we, we sort of uh, moved on to, to focusing on solo exhibitions and, and maybe Faust will, will talk more about that. Maybe we can go to the next slide too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so um, so I gave you a few slides. So I, I, I'm, I'm just gonna, because it's not an order of um, kind of the, the progression, uh, which, is, which is fine. Um, Nonlinearity is okay by me. <laughs> um, but, uh, but basically to, to answer and to speak to what you were saying, Andrew, um, yeah, so there is a lot of shape shifting and so it really is thinking through um, kind of how we can organize and put things together, um, contextualizing art, uh, talking about art, talking about our place and moment of time and moment in time and, and what is uh, kind of what are artists thinking about and producing. So, so yes, the first project that kind of you know brought us together in in, in doing this was this kind of brief, winter spring brief histories uh 2011 and then um if you click on to a the the slide though with like um isaac on a on a there it that is. one so you know uh, we kind of it, it ended up um, in Brooklyn and being here, kind of having to like regroup and find our community and um, wanting to also, you know, be 
um, you know, be with people and, and Isak is an artist. I'm a curator and writer. Isak's also an educator. He teaches art. And, and so we did this, um, uh, one night, um, it's okay to be of a time, um, and, and, and did this, Isak did a, a, um, a performance and, uh, and so on. And so that was kind of a way of, um, uh, finding our, our place just at, at that moment of kind of of landing here we'd been living here for a couple of years and just kind of finding our footing um and you and then you can move on to i believe there's another yeah then there's our uh, publication um and the ice cream project so basically tame the wilderness um when we were when we were in lockdown uh, we started thinking again, you know, about brief histories, um, because at the same time, you know, we're doing these projects, but we're also doing other things. We're curating and writing and teaching and making art. Um, and so we wanted to use this publication to also to, again, think about our place in, in this time and think ab about how we can um, connect, uh, you know, while being separated from each other. And so when things started to open up again, um, you can move to the slide of the ice cream um, thing. We made this kind of icy cream project where we started selling ice cream in the park because it was one of the only places, you know, where we could be outdoors um, um, and, um, and to kind of raise funds, which as you will read in the issue, we didn't really raise much funds. We pretty much paid for that ice box and the and and so on but it was also another way of kind of uh checking the temperature of saying uh talking to people and um and yeah talking to people and 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 learning about what is going on on the ground um so um the they were kind of uh icy cream was like three dollars a pop um, and we just bike it over to Prospect Park and be doing this um, throughout until we were finally able to put this together, which was a uh, risograph uh, printed here in Manhattan and then, you know, all the artists and it ended up being distributed at Printed Matter and um, some other bookstores and one thing led to the other and then we ended up with the space because we wanted to um, kind of see this, what was happening in this publication um, kind of uh, uh, manifest uh, in space. And so, um, and so therefore we have our exhibitions and then you have a slide of, you know, um, where we thought of um, our group show Inheritance. Yeah, this one in particular, you have um, Joe Nami's installation um, in the corner with the plant and the two photographs and the headset um, by Howard Dina Pindell's uh, work. Um, Joe Nami is um, um, is um, is doing research on the work of electronic music composer um, Halim Adab, um, who is Egyptian and moved to the United States and. Um, and and basically thinking about these kind of worked alongside Cage and and yeah worked alongside Cage uh, um, and well known American history of avant garde music yeah okay go on. no sorry um, <laughs> and and um, and then we brought we wanted to bring this in um, dialogue with many other uh, works and in this installation view you have Howardina Pindell's um, uh, piece there and kind of thinking about the the resonance and the reverberations uh both with sound and both with history and both um you know uh as we wrote you know considering the tremors of our histories caught in a feedback loop and rippling and reverberating um and so we wanted to look back and think of all the work and all the the um, uh, these artists that have crossed paths with us, and in this accumulation, in this kind of in inheritance of uh, you know our ever transforming culture, um, and how this kind of has resonated through us, um, and so 
what how what were the possibilities for you know creating and transmitting these inherited you know rights genetics and this case of Coleman Collins's um, uh, exhibition, uh, ecologies, knowledge, um, and power, and what codes are uh, inherited in, in these material histories. Um, and did you want to talk about, you, you mentioned you wanted to talk about the abstraction. No, I think this, this is, that's, that's okay. exactly the conversation. Uh, also about access and who gets to, um, who has the, the, the ability to speak um, and in, and in what format? Well, I, I, yeah, I mean, I, I I've loved your programming. Uh, your current show is amazing as well. Um, I'd like to open things up, and also I know Miguel has to to take off. But one of the things I'm excited about, we just have had so much to get through, is I think great things happen from very opinionated people sharing a room together. And I love uh, all of your opinions. I feel like I'm a pretty opinionated person. And Miguel, before you take off, I'm wondering if there are um, other galleries or spaces or particularly ex exhibitions that you think of as important or like a playlist, if you will, of like things you're thinking about uh, in regards to your gallery over the years. <clears throat> well, yeah, when you asked the question, I, I can name two, I mean, there's many, but I can name two that were mm -hmm that I always think about, you know, as a kind of, as a source of inspiration. One was the Jean-Luc Godard show at the Pompidou Center in 2006, which was um, a wonderful example of anarchic, anarchic installation of inventing a show out of uh, a catastrophic um, situation where, you know, he had gotten to a point where he wasn't speaking to anybody. He had spent all the, the million euros that he was given as a fee to produce the show and nobody wanted to work anymore. And he just kind of came up and just made this incredible installation, which had, which had so much, you know, freedom built into it, cables, posters, uh, a miniature train going around, uh, carrying bananas between uh, rooms. It was just, you know, wonderful, wonderful imaginative show so that's that's one that i always think about when I'm not sure what to do another one was more recent maybe people saw it it was a trisha donnelly show at matthew marks maybe two years ago three years ago which was uh an amazing show with like extremely heavy stones um tremendous lighting situation a back room uh, a hallway which was open so the rain was coming through um, she's really, uh, uh, Trisha Donnelly is, a, is an incredible installer, stretching, stretching the, uh, the assumptions that we sometimes have uh, for every object position in space. Uh, I'm not sure what else to say, which is a very inspiring show. Um, and then the third one was just a show I did with Richard Tuttle. I mean, I was just an associate uh, at a previous space that I worked with in which he came in and um, with a show of his and he started moving lights in all kinds of directions that had nothing to do with lighting the objects, freeing the lights from their function, submissive function as lighting the objects on the walls. And that was inspiring too. So, you know, I tend to like those kinds of shows that free up the situation and the assumptions that we, we have. Um, yeah. Spe speaking of which, I love the lighting in your current exhibition of Island oh. Finland. I think it's, I think it's, uh, it's so wonderful it sets such a presence in this space it's great yeah yeah, yeah. thank you yeah, thank you so much um wallace what about you uh, are, what are, are those exhibitions or programs that you think of uh or canada was inspired by or you were inspired by um i guess you know early on i i, I mean i remember being really impressed with uh, american fine arts um when mm -hmm. it still existed in the uh, lower Soho. Um, I just like the sense of irony that they had about the um, program. And I also enjoyed how confusing it was to go to that space. You know, you couldn't tell if someone worked there, if they were the artist, you know, who is who. It just felt very um, unstructured. There was no front desk when you walked in. You know, there wasn't the penalty box with the, per you know, the unhappy person sitting there 
typing away. You know, it just felt like more of an open situation. Although, you know, the artwork that they showed and what I'm gr normally gravitating towards doesn't always mesh, but I think that atmosphere was great. Um, and then I thought of the uh, Tom of Finland Foundation in uh, Echo Park in LA. It's uh, where he lived with Dirk, uh, his partner, and also kind of model. And Dirk is, was still, I don't know if he's still alive, but is was alive. And it, so it was like this exhibition of the work and also their home. So it was sort of like very layered and Dirk was still living there. And so you kind of would go through and like, there was the bedroom with all the motorcycle boots lined up. And there's this parlor space with like floor to ceiling drawings, you know, and then there's the kitchen and do you like chicken? Like we have some extra chicken, you know, this sort of like, it was a very open feeling um, kind of domestic situation. I'll never forget that um, that place is an art experience, you know, it felt very different to me. So I think those are the two that I kind of came up with. Yeah. Um, I love that. Yeah, those are great. I, I have some similar things, but uh, I, Faust and Isak, what are some are there some exhibitions or spaces that come to mind for you that have affected the way you think of brief histories? Um, well, I mean, I, I honestly, uh, Andrew, I can't think of a single one, one standout uh, show um, since you asked that hmm. question at the beginning. <laughs> I put you all on the spot. Yeah. I never know what to say when it, right, when it right. you know, but I, I will say that a lot of, um, th for me, a lot of the inspiration and a lot of what I learn, it really uh, comes down to um, the artists that I've been in conversation with and in dialogue with. Um, the exhibition, um, the, you know, recently, uh, working with uh, Jumana Mana on her exhibition, Late Night Strollers, and um, installing together and troubleshooting and building with her all of these um, interesting uh, pedestals and ways of exhibiting and showing uh, sculpture um, was you know, it, to me was ex extremely liberating because I, I, I just then realized how much I learned from working with her over, carried over to the next two shows that we did at the space. Um, I think people and their methodologies, people like, you know, um, Brian O'Doherty, um, uh, who has, who led uh, uh, an extremely um, uh, interesting life uh, with art, with writing, uh, with thinking about the white cube and the gallery space. I think that really informed me, especially when I was younger and studying, uh, you know, you know, studying curating and even studying art um, uh, uh, really kind of uh, made a big impression on me. Um, you know, um, and, um, you know, do you, did, did you come up with anything in the meantime? <laughs> no, I'm listening attentively, I think is a great <laughs> Brian yeah. Doherty was also at the first show with a mural, um, which, uh, mm -hmm. which was an amazing experience to, um, to work with somebody like right he sent us he sent us a mural he sent us instructions to execute a mural that um wrote out the word silence in arabic uh which uh, is uh, the word is sumt which means silence and uh, of course this is uh, you know in response to our call for our exhibition but um th this in in this way of like working with people working with artists and practitioners um i think that has um taught me a lot about how to uh come up uh whether it's a a theme or an idea or an installation or even even in my writing and and so on um i mean this isn't a gallery show but i think i was very very excited when um, you know, um, the, the, the show about just above Manhattan at the MoMA mm -hmm. uh, came out and, mm -hmm. and that was actually, for, uh, you know, for me as somebody that I, I didn't grow up here, I, 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 I grew up 
you know, in, in, in the Arab world. I grew up in um, Canada. I grew up um, also here a little bit, but, but I'd, I'd say that, you know, with those, with that experience, with those experiences, um, you know, of, of uh, having to learn English several times, depending on where I'm at, <laughs> where, where I live, um, uh, I think uh, I, I was very excited by seeing the show um, that was about um, another, you know, a gallery and a, a person working with artists and working um, in a in a way that had to kind of um, go against the structure that that wasn't in support that wasn't you know um supporting her and the artists that she was working uh to to um amplify um mm -hmm. so i think those are kind of really um exciting things for me and and to think about how to uh work uh, differently and i don't have the answer to that but mm -hmm. but but it is how to work differently and how to not you know um how to not um, have to run to sign up for the art fair rat race or um, um, do the shows that will um, sell or not sell, but have to how to figure out to keep up the criticality and our commitment and responsibility to art and artists that we work with and have that long and durational conversation and, and slow thinking and working. Completely. Yeah. Thank you so much for, yeah. I mean, that just above Midtown show is incredible. Um, I was thinking about after I asked you all the question, I realized I had to come up with a list and I, something I put in the email was, um, I, I think often about Rosemary Trockel's show at the new museum back in 2012, uh, the idea of creating this wonder or like the first floor was all of her influence. I think artists have kind of since done that, but it was the first time I realized that influence was not something to make, be made visible, but it was something to that had to get into your exhibition as well. Um, and I love shows that acknowledge space, going back to what Wallace said, uh, like the Who's Afraid of Jasper John show that uh, Gavin Brown and Urs Fisher put together that used vinyl to show this, the, the show that had happened right before and put new works uh, before I love thinking of spaces as a gesture that has uh, and also works that uh, shows that respond to a weird space as most of you know I'm a part of Blow Grand and uh, I, I love the artists that that take our weird weird space into consideration and um, take full advantage of it um, and the context of it and the historical context of it and don't treat it as a white cube as you said Faust. Um, yeah, I've got many more, but um, you know, one last thing to end on, and I know we have questions from the audience, so I want to keep it uh, and give you all the chance to speak to this wonderful panel. But um, something I found myself within my teaching practice more and more is uh, encouraging my students to open up space for themselves and for others uh, through curation. And I ask them, what do Willem de Kooning, Irving Sandler, Alex Katz, Philip Perlstein, Yayoi Kasama and Yoko Ono all have in common, uh, and it's that they all ran galleries. Uh, they were part of Tanager Gallery, Enhanza Gallery, uh, Camino, Trial Balloon. Um, yes, being an artist, a rite of passage is running a space, and I'm excited and honored to get to talk to some of you who, uh, it wasn't just a rite of passage, it's an ongoing plow horse, uh, Wallace, and those of you who uh, make sure that, uh, Endurance is the most important thing we can offer each other. So thank you all for being a part of this issue and for showing um, that longevity. And uh, I want to now give you all a chance to ask questions if you have them. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thanks so much, Andrew and everyone. Um, so we have a couple questions here. I'm going to turn it to our friend GE first. She'll be able to unmute. Oh, thank you, Carolyn. And thank you, Andrew, as always, we bring it and thank you to this panel. My question is, are changes in spaces just that changes without increase? And is this because we experience as well a kind of continuing present from which we nor are really approached nor depart from kind of present um, 
from which neither develops nor declines. Um, are you meaning literal spaces or physical spaces, GE? Yeah, I'm thinking of both, actually, because I mean, the, the space mm. itself, for example, I was thinking of some, some galleries that have been instrumental to quote history of art and culture mm. and everything else have, have moved and, and taken up various spaces at various yes. times. But at the same mm. time, they, they've stayed true to something, some core thing, but they moved on physically and but they've carried some kind of arc of of what they were and their dna taking it forward um yeah i mean i think i think uh Faust and isak are the ones to handle this but i mean also wallace uh Kand has moved a few times but um you know uh, you know uh, if if i've ever been drunk around any of you you probably heard me uh, talking about 10th street galleries and how important they were for the galleries of madison avenue and that the space itself even if it lasts a year or two trial balloon lasting only for three years uh many of the best spaces only last for a few months of the years but uh can develop a scene or a culture uh so i'm definitely part of the audience that that is up for that that change but Faust and isak how do you feel about that? Well, I think the, <clears throat> I think that a lot of um, people in our position are um, in a constant state of precarity. And I think that um, um, that requires um, a kind of um, um, sustainability and a kind of know-how to to cope with uh, various kinds of pressures um, that include everything from what you what was said earlier about professionalization pressures of professionalization to pressures of just um, sustaining anything um, and I think that a lot of the time the the change of uh, organization or space or the way that <clears throat> we do things um, are in concert with what is reasonable and available in that given moment. So that makes it very uh, responsive. Um, and that is to say that I think <clears throat> we are also always saying, well, um, um, change shouldn't always be about growing bigger. Um, and, and we think about our books a lot. They're really big. The books are big because they have so many pages and so much forethought and so much editing goes into them that we use them as a user manual for years into our programming and into, into what we say and how we think. And, um, they become they become really sort of like instruments or gu uh, field guides. Um, so that that's kind of uh, how we go uh, with the full full awareness that um, maybe sustaining um, a space will be challenging, but we are also interested in the fight. Um, and um, and and maybe um, that that change in in size or in um, the might of uh of our organization um will will just kind of follow along um the ability in that in that given situation um i think that there are a lot of things that uh, come in in, in in friction uh with this uh when it comes to keeping a space on on in manhattan on a main street um, um making rent and uh keeping a lease and uh um, and then also we think a lot about our relationships with artists and the promise um, or the aspiration that we keep in uh, sustaining uh, this work um, so that we, we, we invite artists into something that, um, that they can um, imagine into the future together with us. So, so that's a kind of commitment that... Um, we we uh, are at this time in the from where we're speaking we we are still navigating and developing like what is our uh what is sure what can we promise 
for our community. Um, but uh, but we also and uh, that is this is the reason we also work with people that understand that state of precarity right along with us and are willing to um, to risk with us and uh, and and you know to work together with us. Well, so but also I think like I'd love to hear your answer to the question because I feel I um, you really involved community um, and grew with community. Um, as you shifted spaces um, and and uh, earned this trust with so many artists that that helped you kind of get into a bigger space. I'm wondering how, as you change spaces, how it affected your curation and what you how you think about running the gallery. Yeah, I mean, I think that sense of growth is really a big big part of our decisions to move and and growth doesn't mean more money necessarily, but it was like, what do, what do, what do these artists require? So it felt, always felt like some sort of a, a partnership with the people we were showing. And frankly, we didn't wanna be treated like a spare parts uh, machine for bigger art galleries, you know, like come in and raid, you know, whatever they can get out of it in terms of money. And so it was a, it was a decision to stay and fight you know like keep a community together like people that came up together um and you know communities they can only get so big you know there's there's always that issue that they could get too large and then no one is having any needs met via the community so there was always this challenge to kind of find that right balance between um what the right size is versus like what the kind of economic and art world demands were made of us while not losing that sort of um, spirit of like conversation and sort of mutual support. And um, so, yeah, that was sort of the balancing act and also just a commitment to, to um, making a gallery that felt accessible to an audience. You know, so every, every time we moved, every time we changed, um, putting the space together was really critical to think about how, how our people coming in and are they, you know, able to use the bathroom? Are they going to be, you know, feel like they're included in, in some way? How, how can we do that with programming? How can we do that publication? So as we've gotten bigger and older, we've had to kind of always kind of check back with our sort of kind of founding principles and, and try to make sure that every step that we have made, you know, to kind of continue to exist is in some you know, uh, alignment with what the original concepts or original goals of the, the thing were, because like you said, I think like uh, longevity is very important. I think important studio practices are long studio practices. And I think long ga running galleries are important galleries because they have a certain history that you cannot, you can't replicate it any other way than besides doing it. You know, so embedding th this institution has history embedded in it and a practice has history embedded in it. And those are really important things to keep um, alive, you know, because you can't go back in time and redo that. You know, that's, um, yeah, so. <laughs> yeah, I, I really appreciate you saying that, Wallace, because I think that's something I think about all the time, or I try to explain to my students or people, I, which is like below grand, it's like if we did 10 group shows a year, and did five people in a group show we only get a chance to help 50 artists and that would be insane to do that <laughs> you know like we so it's like it's like i i have we all have more friends than we're able to help and it's like how yeah. do you create a community that doesn't concretize at the edge you know like i i oftentimes hear young artists being like oh that gallery is a click or that gallery is this or that gallery is that and it's like that gallery is trying to take care of their friends community and they're having trouble or they're trying to take care of their people and they're already at max resources trying to do that and so your best bet is to start a space for your community yeah 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 not yeah. expect someone else to do it. and that's you know that's the tragedy of a gallery is it yeah. you know only reach so many people you know that and but mm -hmm. there's ways in which our impact, I'm sure, is is we're not even aware of, you know. So it's um, kind of important to remind ourselves that 
these things do matter in ways that you don't necessarily can't quantify or put your finger on that that the audience is bigger than maybe you realize um and i think that that's has something to do with getting older you know learning learning the value of being older versus the value of starting out which is also equal and um you know equally as as, as powerful in a certain way so Chloe, I'm wondering if we have any other questions, but I also maybe want to take the time just to uh, thank uh, Wallace and Miguel had to jump off and uh, Faust and Isak. Uh, I appreciate your persistence and uh, glad that you're still going. And hopefully, uh, as you said, you, you go, you continue on, not just for yourselves, but for others like me and for the people in this room that look to you as exciting parts of this community. Great. Yeah, thank, thank you, Andrew. Um, we just have one last question um, from our very own Fong Bui. So go ahead, Fong. Mike is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Yo, Wallace. Sorry that I didn't see Miguel here who left, but um, you were mentioned about the co-op gallery in the 50, in the 60, Andrew, it's so interesting because I remember walking with my friend, um, Rudy Buckhart, the great photographer, filmmaker, good friend of the Kunin, took all those pictures. And he was telling me this remarkable story in the 50s when the Kunin, after having already painted the woman series at Signia Janus Gallery, they were walking on Broadway because he moved to Broadway. Uh, which was a big leap from the East Village. And they were walking and some angry young painter came up to him and say, are you Mr. De Kunin, you know? And he said, yes, I am indeed. And, and he said, what are, how did you like it when everybody is painting like you, sir? And he said, well, that's not my problem whatsoever. He said, well, you know why? because they could always paint a good lacunin, but they can't paint the bad ones. It's so interesting because thinking about, I brought this story up to Irvin Sandler, because Irvin was a very close friend to the rail from the beginning. And of course, having read his book, New York School um, in college. And the, the, the great, you know, Connell, basically the overview of that period, 50, 60, was that there were allowance. So many artists run gallery. You mentioned Tanninger, you mentioned Hansa, Brata, and I don't know, and then Ruben Gallery, there was Ruben. different kind of artists who were shown. Very important. Thing. Very important. I don't know, you remember that great show at Great Art Gallery? That yes. was 2017, so. It's very comprehensive. And the idea of comprehensiveness of that community is due to artist run galleries. So there's a certain kind of aesthetic morality that embrace in each of those people's vision. There was colonization of gesture painting, there was field painting, there was gestural realism, and there were what assemblage. You know, and there was Duchamp aesthetic, and there was, of course, happening and whatnot. My question to you guys all is, given the fact that there's a certain more aesthetic morality that you all have, you know your taste, you know the constituent of artists that you want to support. Is there enough dialogue overlap? In other words, instead of just going to your own gallery and your friend create your own so-called follower to that gallery uh, this is a good instant where you are talking you're all talking uh, one thing I realized that when Trump says social distancing we have to do the opposite the competition between one another is no longer doable productive the dialogue had to be shared the exchange of intellectual and artistic ideas and invention. Uh, it's not like you can steal from idea from someone else and replicate somewhere else's. So the morality of your own aesthetic taste is crucial principle to your own 
doing, making, organizing, and maintaining it. So my question is very simple. Uh, how do you see the community come and go? And how does it mean, what does it mean to maintain that poise, that endurance? The idea is endurance, really. What endurance mean to each of you? Sorry for making my question so long. It should be just short. What is endurance mean to you all? <laughs> Why don't we start with, with, uh, with you, Wallace? Um, that's, I mean, that's a great question. And um, I mean, you have to find inside the practice of running a gallery that nourishment, you know, that keeps you awake because otherwise it's, it's deadening. It's, it's, it's just about ego. It's about individual people. It's about sort of patting each other on the back. There's got to be a way that the gallery continues to like expand, even even if it isn't getting physically bigger, but intellectual. I mean, I think the uh, Black Lives Matter movement was a really wonderful opportunity for us to examine uh, race within our, you know, what ended up being uh, quite a white group of people and sort of trying to say, well, how did that happen and why? And how can we sort of talk about this? And, you know, trying to find problems for yourself that puts you in contact with, people and places and, and art that you're not as comfortable with, I think it's always that reach. And yeah. I, think, I, think a, I think an institution has to be ambitious to, to be willing to try, not just to superficially show that they're morally superior, but also like be willing to like take on the next problem. If, if the problem is just starting, that's a one problem. If it's like, looking at the art world as a sort of an organism that's unfair, that's another problem. You know, like as you get bigger and, and stronger, you can think about things in a bigger way, I think. So I don't know, that was, that was what I popped in my head as, as you were talking, but uh, I think yeah. you're right. I think, I think there is a way that the art world could get very balkanized. And I think that the, I think the market is designed, designed in a way so we don't talk to each other. It's supposed yeah. to be segmented it's supposed to be, uh, very uh, particularized to our own little world without thinking in a, in a more broad sense. You know, I think we're, I think we're trained in a way to, to not, um, to be wary of the outsider, you know, instead of like questioning ourselves, you know, like, um, so I think that's a good question. I think I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. What about you guys? Yeah. There are different parts. Um of your question, which made us think of different things. But I think on the uh, on the issue of endurance, I think we are um, experts at that. Mm -hmm. That's probably that's probably what we leverage uh, most. Um, and that and that relates to um, uh, the, the relationships that we keep with people that are not only the artists um, involved, but um, all of the people that we get involved in, including other galleries. We it, it might feel um, uh, trivial to mention, but uh, you know we even loaned equipment um, from various spaces in our neighborhood. Um, I can mention them, a particular very special monitor from Participant Inc. or a particular chairs um, from Bridget chairs Donahue. from Bridget. Yeah. <laughs> so um, so there are some uh, things that are kind of matter of uh, daily needs. Uh, while there are others that are more um, sort of um, drawn out in time and into the future uh, relationships that um, we um, discuss with our um, with our community how to work on problems in, in for the long run um, or strategize for ideas uh, for the long run. Um, something else, what was said about endurance? Maybe yet, maybe I said. Well, and I, I and I think you know, I think like the endurance as in also to um, you know, endure and keep up and continue and have the will to to do this. Um, uh, like you know, I uh, you know, like Wallace was saying. I mean, it 
I've found a lot of, you know, difficulties, uh, the most when it's kind of like um, difficulties, again, that's a, the, the, the other term that's coming around, back around, but, but just kind of thinking about how uh, to not just uh, work on, alone. Um, I think working alone um, within this context, that's, uh, that's when it feels like, oh, I don't know why I'm doing this anymore. Um, I, I don't know what the point of this is, but in moments of uh, being in this chat room together and having these conversations or in the moments of bringing together um, the publication or the show, whether it's a group show or a solo show and having the conversation, then you realize I'm not alone in having these uh, ideas or worries or thoughts or concerns. And also, I'm not the only one that might be having these experiences of um, uh, how it feels, what it feels like to be in the world from, you know, perhaps like maybe my perspective. Um, and, and then there's, there's, then you find a lot of uh, things in common with others. And then therefore that kind of brings that, that uh, motivation or the energy, the fuel, the nourishment to continue this the endurance. Um, it's really difficult to sustain the conversation where things are so um, critical and urgent when we're dealing with an ongoing, you know, the, like the, 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 uh, you know, the pandemic and, and, and the um, ongoing, you know, uh, whatever, the, the, the climate crisis, or, I mean, we didn't even talk about race or class or any of these other things that, you know, those are really serious matters that we are confronting, confronted with as well. So, um, uh, yeah, I think, I think it's, it's at times when, you know, bringing people together is, 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 I think the fuel for that endurance. Um, yeah, that's that's what I, I think. That's good. I I just want to add one last thing is that um, um, you know, women's march also was very important as much as Black Lives Matters, and kudos to to Canada taking on my old friend Kathy Bradford, whose eighty first birthday was literally two days ago, Sunday. Yeah, Wonderful. and. Yeah, and at the outset, I sort of like greeted her because I know Kathy's through Chris Martin since 1994. So that's how long we, we know each other. And she only got celebrated, became more well-known when she joined Canada, first show there. Mm -hmm. So that's endurance too, which uh, I can't help but to sort of quote it, this wonderful African, African proverb that goes, when you want to go fast go alone if you want to go far go together so that's one of the most important thing in what we do with the rail so thank you so much thank you andrew thank you you all and uh i can't wait to re-listen to it a day later so back to you again carolyn thank you thank you, you Son. thank you all um yeah, so here at The Rail, we have a tradition of ending our community events with a poetry reading. And today I'm so thrilled to welcome Jen Fisher to the stage. Jen Fisher is a poet living in Queens. Her book, In the Mud, was published in 2020 by Desuetude Press, and she has a forthcoming chapbook with F Magazine. She's also part of a group show at Harry Smith's Shirt. I'm sorry, a group show called Harry Smith's Shirt opening at F Gallery in Houston, Texas on April 1st, organized and curated by Adam Marnie. Uh, and I'll turn it over to you, Jen. Thank you so much for being here. Um, thank you guys for having me for the conversation. It was really interesting to listen to all of you talk. I felt like I was hearing a secret for some reason, I don't know why. <laughs> Just like really beautiful conversation. Um, I'm just gonna read a couple poems, like five really, really, really short ones. Um, um, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, okay. Dying in Chinatown, March, 2021. Your fingertip, your fingerprints are beautiful. Our conquest of love never materialized soft sutures of burnt emotions. Eyes circled, spirits circling eyes come back. 
chanting voices raised almost to song or echoes of. The acupuncturist says, lay back on the table, circular light fixed to ceiling, circular grief fixed to, can I put the needle in your heart? Jacket unfastened to be undressed, if only partially, if only by a stranger, a sensation of primal desire. Close your eyes, lingering ash. The death this year was my worst death yet. Um, this one's New York City, summer 2021. Half loving what was once loved is a hell bound, driven deep crevice of earth, cracked and dry edged, roughed and worn down. How down can one keep this spun fire circular motion of hell spinning, trying to desire the one, one past promised to love. Strike through this crust of clout of lies. Let salt run water pour down. Untie the under desired, loose hanging on to nothing. It is nothing now. Oh, the freedom to be unbound. It's weird having a reading with my cat, I'm sorry. It's like he's in the background playing. Um, October 26, 2022. There was a science to it all, a morning. A, you cannot have everything you want. And why not? The world still stone cold would be just as cool. Italy, October, 2022. Signaling home in the night, I found my breath in the crackling fireworks outside, illuminations liberated from children's hands, chaotic eruptions at Dante's feet, volcano, volcanic explosions of laughter, of light, cast against decaying statues, limbs severed above elbows revealed then disappear, decaying features animated begin to breathe. I pass two teenage lovers fervently kissing, grinding hips into hips on the steps of a church in the city center. Feral movements of desire, the only way to live. Napolini, Alive, she thrives in anguish. February 10th. There was a tear in the sky, a shooting star with vacant eyes. Meditate on the number nine. Today will be the day. Release the swine. And this is the last one from this month, um, March, 2023. Loving a long highway, I ride my bicycle through Queens at sunrise, a cherished, a cherished city silenced, the desolated ruins of the industrial shoreline exposed, lands not untouched by humans, but equally regrown and reborn by the vegetation that took root in the after. Deserted, undesirable land. And I think this, this feels like living, like the breathing pulse of a city 
the symbiosis of where architectural assemblages and weeds collide, the dance between the two, the rusting, the decay, the space it creates to come alive. Sweet, beautiful city flourishing in the honesty of the unsurveilled. It is she who is abandoned that is most wild in her desire to survive. Sorry, that's it. Wow, thank you so, so much, Jen. That was incredible. Um, and thank you all so much for today. Thank you to Miguel and Isak and Faust and Wallace and Andrew. Um, we would also like to thank the Terra Foundation for sponsoring our NSC program and making these conversations possible and for their support of our growing archive, which you can view on the Rails YouTube channel. For the past 22 years, the Brooklyn Rail has provided a platform for the arts, culture, and politics through a monthly publication and public events like our daily NSC. Please check the chat for a link to donate. And join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. for a poetry reading curated by Noah Mendoza. And you can now all turn your microphones on and say hello and goodbye as you leave. Thank you so much again. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank, Thank you. you all so much. Thank, Thank you, guys. You. Thank, Thank you so much. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And for a great critics page. <laughs>